questions. But with that, we will go ahead and get started on the actual the, the presentation and the material that we will cover. So we will start by defining weeds. What exactly is a weed? Then we will discuss the weed biology and the importance of that. Uh, we'll also cover the consequences and the value that weeds can bring to the table. Um, we'll then kind of move into defining IPM. So what, what is IPM? What does that even stand for? And then the actual steps that you can use to implement IPM in your garden. And so one of the things I want you to recognize is, you know, IPM is not a one size fits all. Um, and so what you do, what, what commercial growers do on really large scales doesn't always translate down to the home gardener and vice versa. But what does work with one size can work with more than one size. And so what you see in the top picture there is of my personal garden, the one that my husband and I have here at our house. And what we do in that garden does not exactly reflect what is done in the bottom picture, which is a sweet potato field here in Wayne County. Um, and you know, these guys are growing two, three, four thousand acres of sweet potatoes. It's gonna be a little difficult for them to run out there and put cardboard between the rows. Um, but those are things, you know, those may be slight differences, but it's still IPM can be implemented um, on whatever scale you might be working with. So to start off, um, what is a weed? So a lot of times when we have these presentations and we think and people ask us, what is a weed? You know, oftentimes the first answer folks will come up with is a plant out of place. Well, I've taken a number of weed science classes since I've started at NC State and I will tell you that while that's a, an okay answer, it's just that it's an okay answer. It doesn't really tell us what a weed is. Um, so I'm going to put a, I normally have a laser pointer when I do this in person. So hopefully you can see this red dot um, on the screen so that as I point out things, you can kind of follow along. Um, so while a plant out of place isn't really descriptive of a weed, um, I had two professors that to me have given very good uh, definitions of a weed. So the first one by Dr. Jordan is a plant that's competitive, it's persistent, and it's pernicious. So it's going to be undesirable because they interfere with human activities. And then Dr. Leon said that a weed is a plant that causes economic damage and thrives in highly or repeatedly disturbed areas that are caused by humans. So if we kind of break that down, we can understand now that weeds by nature are going to be competitive, persistent, and pernicious. So that kind of defines that, that characteristic of those weeds. So they're, they're just very aggressive typically or just highly competitive. But then what they are in light of the area is they're gonna be undesirable, right? So undesirable because they cause economic damage, but also because they're just in the way, right? And so we see that third component of weeds is that weeds are weeds because as humans, we deem them so. Um, when you mow your lawn and there are, you know, and henbit comes up in the wintertime or spurge comes up, you know, that is deemed by us as undesirable. It's something that we don't like. But then when we're out in the garden and we till up the soil, when you turn that soil over, you're bringing those seeds up. That's human activity that brings about the problem, right? So just kind of keep that in mind as we talk about weeds. And as you think about what a weed is, you know, whether you have one in mind that you're thinking, wow, I really wish you know, I could get rid of this. So um, definition of a weed is not just a plant out of place, but one that is very competitive and is there due to human activity. Okay, so when we think about weeds though, we need to go back to the basics, right? We need to understand the weed biology of that weed. So understanding that biology will help us better manage those weeds, right? So in, when we say biology, what we're referencing to is is those basic you know concepts that we probably all learned if, back when we took either the master gardener class or even biology from way back when right so that includes things like your life cycle right what is the is it an annual summer weed is it a biennial is it perennial does it just come up in the winter time um, you know so understanding that life cycle just like here we've got this purple dead nettle well to understand that that's a winter weed will help us to know how to target and to manage that weed better. But also understanding that monocot versus dicot, right? So is it a broadleaf or is it a grass? Um, and not just a grass, but is it a grass or a sedge or is it wild garlic? You know, is it um, uh, something along those lines um, or is it more of that broadleaf category? And then to 
again, recall like what's the reproductive capacity of that weed. So when we talk about most annual plants, we're considering the seed dispersal method, so or seed reproductive method. And then we want to think about how is that seed dispersed, right? So this is cat's ear dandelion right here, um, which is in the uh, Asteraceae family. And you can see that those seed heads just look like they want to be blown around in the wind. You can think about a dandelion as another example. And so how do those weeds spread um, in order to be moved throughout either your garden or your lawn or your landscape area? But when we talk about perennial plants, usually it's by sexual, asexual reproduction. Um, you know, so you've got stolons, rhizomes, tubers, bulbs. Again, if you think about Bermuda grass, which I know so many of you love, especially there in the Piedmont area, um, but you know, we've got Bermuda grass that spreads by rhizomes. Um, you've got here in the bottom right corner is a tuber from Florida Betany, which we have a lot of here in my yard. And to understand that just because you pull that up doesn't mean that you're not going to leave something behind. So recognize these three things this life cycle, you know, how, what type of plant is it, monocot versus cycot, and then your reproductive capacity. But not just weed biology, you also have to remember the weed morphology, right? So identification is the key to management. That's kind of your limiting factor. If you can't, you can say all day long that, okay, this plant grows in the wintertime or it grows in the summertime, or this plant seems to come back over and over again. But if you can't actually identify it, it's going to be, make it that much more difficult to actually, um, to, to manage it. And so when we think about identification and morphology, remember it's things like leaf arrangement. So are they, are the leaves alternate or opposite on the stem? Are they whirled around the stem? So this purple dead nettle here in the bottom right corner has those opposite leaves. When we talk about leaf type, we're considering is it compound? Is it simple? Um, you know, a lot of our leaves are simple, but if it's a compound leaf, that can actually help you marry that down a lot. Um, then stem characteristics, is it, you know, is it pubescent? Is it a square stem like you see in henbit and purple dead nettle? Um, flower characteristics, right? So this is off uh, um, uh, narrow leaf vetch. So vetch is in the, the pea family, so a very distinct pea or bean looking leaf in the Fabaceae family. And then, you know, all the different words that you have, pubescent, scabrous, glossy, describing the, the texture of the leaf or the stem or any portion of that plant. And here, the bigger picture on to the left is, uh, is mulberry weed. And if you're familiar with that, when you rub across that leaf, it's very, very scabrous. So it almost feels like a cat's tongue, which can be identifying characteristic to say, hey, okay, I, I'm feeling this, you know, that kind of helps you narrow it down. So remember those, again, we're going back to the basics, right? So um, those basic concepts that we learned and how do you identify and recognize what the weed is so that we can move forward in actually how do we manage it. So just wanted to talk about, you know, what are some of the consequences of weeds? Now, if I were to ask you, and if this was, you know, a live audience, um, in person rather, where I could say, hey, shout out a couple things that we would say are, why are weeds bad? You know, you can always come up with a ton of things on why things are bad, right? On the, the negative side of things. Why that happens for us, I, I don't know, as humans. Um, you know, whereas if, if I said, okay, what's good about a weed, then it's a little bit more difficult to come up with. But for the consequences of weeds, you know, we have competition for resources, right? Weeds, just like the plants and the crops you're growing, are competing for the light, the nutrients, the water, the space, all of that is in competition between those weeds and those crops. And so if you look here at this picture on the right um, or upper right, you've got <laughs> what some of you may not be familiar with because it tends to be more of a row crop uh, weed, but is Palmer amaranth is growing here in this bed. Now there's supposed to be some sweet potatoes in there, but you cannot see them, right? Because it is full of Palmer amaranth. Well, guess how many sweet potatoes you're probably gonna get out of that um, bed at the end of the fall when you go to dig it up? Probably almost none, right? Because those roots don't have room to grow. They don't have the access to the nutrients they need. Whereas if you look here in this, um, on this bed to the left of it, you see a lot less weeds. You've got more room for those sweet potatoes to grow. Now this is more of a, a commercial planting, but think about that in your garden, right? If you've got 
um, you're trying to let cucumbers or beans or something grow up and all of a sudden you've got this flush of weeds that are coming with it you know those weeds are competing for the same things that your beans and your cucumbers are so at that rate you'll have a reduction in yield right you'll have less productivity from that crop because of that loss of resources you've also got where that weed can be a host plant for other pests so other insects and diseases um, you know that maybe in this that plant that weed plant may be in the same family as your crop plant and they can kind of share some of those additional pest problems also human health can be a consequence so I hopefully you can recognize this wonderful plant right here as poison ivy and for if any of you um, have even a slight reaction to poison ivy you recognize yes indeed that can be harmful to my health because it will about drive you nuts as an itching problem on wherever it makes contact. And I will go ahead and tell you as a word to the wise, if you do not know what poison ivy looks like in the winter time, when there's no leaves on it, nothing that do say leaves of three, let it be, learn really, really quickly what that looks like or you will be like me and learn the hard way. Um, and so, you know, things like poison ivy, poison sumac, um, you know, we even have things like pokeweed that if you don't, if you know in, in the case of small children or, or something like that where if they get a hold of it and they ingest it it can be very damaging um, or can have health consequences uh, we also see where weeds can alter the ecosystems and that's that would be a whole separate um, talk but it, when we consider invasive species right so we get things like privet hedge wisteria kudzu that get into our forest environments and they all of a sudden start to take over, right? And so they can actually drive out some of our native plants um, because of that. And so these are just some of the things, again, you probably could have come up with many of these, if not more. Um, but one of the things I do want to pose to you is what value do weeds have, right? So what benefit can we actually get from weeds, you know, if they're there and present? So one of the things is going to be erosion control. So if you look at this picture here in the top left, uh, this is a field of henbit in the wintertime. And this is around Wayne County where we have very, very sandy soils. And I have experienced basically a dust storm due to one field next to our house that was not in cover and massive wind come by and blew half the dust from the field basically into our driveway. But when you've got a field like this, the weeds are there suppressing and controlling that any possibility for erosion, right? But you also have um, food and cover for wildlife. And so for those of you who like to hunt, potentially, um, or just like to watch wildlife, like we love to sit and watch birds in our yard. And so to have those weeds as food for them um, can kind of enhance that experience. It can also be a habitat for beneficial insects. If you see this picture here, this is um, to the top right, is uh, crimson clover. And it had tons of ladybugs and ladybug larvae on it. And so just a great opportunity to hone in on that and utilize um, beneficial insects and that resource there. Uh, we also have to back to the kind of hindit picture here. It's also providing organic matter to the soil, right? So that's still plant material. While it might be a nuisance to us, as those plants break down and decay, it will apply that organic matter back to the soil. And also just be helpful. We hear a lot of the, the term soil health as a, a big, um, uh, just phrase that we hear nowadays and, and cover over the soil is huge. And so that's what weeds can provide as well. There's also medicinal benefits um, that are out there. I, I don't know any off the top of my head, but I just know that that can be the case. Uh, but in the same respect, to so this second to the last point here, while we said that consequences of weeds is they can harbor pests um, like diseases and insects that we could also see on our crops, it's a double-edged sword because you can actually have those, those weeds can be like a refuge for those insects and disease and it can actually get on the weeds and not get on your crops or at least minimize the amount that gets on your, the crop that you want. And so, like I said, double-edged sword there. So you take it as, you know, what's better for your situation, but just something to consider. And then other options or other things value that weeds have. So <laughs> I've been so excited to be able to use this picture right here, the bottom left. Um, so this was our garden uh, this time last year, approximately before we really got into it. And we had put these collard greens in the ground. We were super pumped. Well, you know, we live out in the country. So the wildlife just think if you plant it, it's for them. So of course the rabbits and the deer decide, well, 
well, we're about to taste this yummy collard greens that you have just put out here for us. So that was aggravating. And I didn't have, you know, we put some uh, to suppress the weeds. You can't, you can kind of see here, but we've got some grass clippings suppressing the weeds. So we had one pest under control, but then we had these deer and rabbits come up. So here I am scav scavenging the yard and found all these different uh, saplings, tree saplings. So oak saplings had some crepe myrtle shoots that were coming up. Um, other variety of, you know, just weeds or what I would have called weeds um, and cut them all and basically made a fence. So that was the way that I could use those weeds, um, take them out of the yard and make them a uh, fence in the garden. But you also will notice that there's this picture on the bottom right that you will see so many times the use of a dandelion in art, right? So some people will see weeds to have artistic value. Um, now, as a gardener, we might be thinking, okay, well, that's real cute for my grandchild or my children to blow the dandelions because they think it's fun. But then when those dandelions are all over my yard, it's not quite so fun, right? So it's all a matter of perspective. But again, just keep these things in mind, the, the consequences and value that weeds can bring to the table and deciding, helping you decide like how it is that you manage those. So to kind of dig in, so we've covered those basic um, concepts about weeds, a lot of which many of you probably are familiar with. So now we're going to dig more deeper into IPM. So asking ourselves, what is IPM? So basically to start with, what does that even stand for, right? And that is IPM stands for Integrative Pest Management. And particular to this talk, we're going to be seeing it in the sense of IWM or integrated weed management and defined integrated pest management is a science-based, socially acceptable, environmentally responsible, and economically practical crop protection against pests. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so just kind of bear with me for a moment, um, but it's science-based, right? So we're looking at how does, how do the land grant universities and extension explain how to control these um, these weeds, right? What are their suggestions and recommendations? Um, and then socially acceptable. So it's something that you feel comfortable with doing. Uh, you know, we all a lot of times get into the, the conversation with chemical control or chemical management. And we'll briefly discuss that at the end. But, you know, some people will say, you know, you know I'm, I'm adequately, adamantly against using herbicides in my yard or pesticides. And then some people will say, you know, I think they're okay. And some of that is how, how does that affect you personally? But as a society, you know, what can we, um, what is considered acceptable, right? You know, uh, and I, I won't go into that too much, but just under, I think that's fairly straightforward. Environmentally responsible kind of um, is just one of those things that, you know, if you spray it, how is that gonna affect, or if you, whatever you do, not just spraying, um, you know, so if you pull up a bunch of weeds that maybe the rabbits were eating, like, is that going to be a detriment to the rabbit population? And for some of you might be like, yeah, that would be great. Like, they get on my nerves. Um, so being environmentally responsible and then economically practical, right? So we're all uh, pretty even keel knowing how our money situation is and going, you know, I don't have a whole lot of money or don't want to spend a whole lot of money on managing these weeds. So what can I do to, you know, not totally empty the pocketbook? Um, but the main, the big goal on all that is crop protection, right, against those pests. Um, so to kind of sum that up, it's basically using, IPM is using all the tools in the pest management toolbox to control those pests, okay? And, and in particular, our toolbox right now that we're talking about is that weed management toolbox, right? And so the title of this um, presentation, which it was kind of long, so I don't exactly remember, but it was something along the lines of, you know, using all the tools in the toolbox. And I know I've been to several talks where they say, use that for phrase toolbox. And it's like, what, what toolbox, right? Like, is, is this what you're talking about? Like, do you mean like this little toolbox, rinky-dink toolbox I got in my shed? Or, you know, my husband has several of those massive, like, mechanic toolboxes? Are we talking about something that big? It's like, no, 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 not, not this kind of toolbox, right? The toolbox we're talking about in particular to IPM is going to be using what we call the PAMS approach. Really simple acronym. I learned this in a class this past spring and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so easy to wrap my mind around. I can, I can grasp this with both hands. So PAM stands for P for prevention, a for avoidance, M for monitor, and S for suppression. So those are steps that you take to, to work on and manage those 
weeds or any pests that you might have, whether it's insects or disease. But again, we will focus on um, using that from a weed management standpoint. So your toolbox is gonna look a little more like this, right on the other side of the shed from your typical, you know, construction toolbox. So it's gonna include things like fertilizer. It can include, you know, herbicides, if that's something that you, you can, you in, are okay using. But it's also things like your trowels, right? Your um, garden hoe, your, let's see what else is in here. Even something like a pruner, right? Your loppers, your pruners those things that will help you to manage those weeds. And we'll kind of, you might be thinking, well, how the heck does fertilizer help with weed management? So we'll cover all that, I promise. Um, and so, yeah, that's what your toolbox will look like. So we're gonna dive into each one of those, um, each one of those approaches, the prevention, avoidance management, or monitor and uh, suppression. So to start with, P is for prevention. And that prevention defined is basically keeping those weeds from infesting the planting area. So as if there were not weeds there or certain weeds there, you're trying to keep them from get coming into your planting area. And, and we'll just use the, the garden, like a vegetable garden example, as that's kind of what I have tailored this program to. So the tools for prevention are gonna be using clean seed, um, using clean transplants. So I know uh, I often go to Lowe's or some to garden center to buy my transplants for the spring, you know, making sure that there's no weeds coming up in those. Um, or for those of you that go to garden centers and you're more of an ornamental person, buying your, your plants, your shrubs um, and flowers, you know, making sure that in those potting media there, the, there's no weeds coming up at the surface, but also things like mulch. I've had a number of people call me and tell me, hey, I've got this weed here that's never, I've never seen it before. And by the time we get around to it, we've discovered, well, they put on some mulch that, you know, recently put some mulch on and that's exactly where those weeds are. So, you know, your mulch, your topsoil, your compost, making sure that they're as weed free as possible. Because if you start clean, it's a lot easier to stay clean. Um, and then preventing weeds from reproducing. So that can be kind of challenging sometimes, but basically it's pulling up those weeds before they even go to flower or before they go to seed at least. Um, and then irrigate desired areas only. We'll cover that a little bit more in detail in just a minute, but it's understanding that you want to irrigate what you want, right? So overhead irrigation is usually not the most ideal because you end up watering so much more than is actually necessary. Um, and then cleaning equipment from use to use. So if you do get out there with the hoe and you're rake it or you're using it to pull up some of those um, those weeds in the garden, just making, you know, it, it, it seems kind of silly, but some of those seed can be really, really pernicious, right, and can stick to the back side of that hoe, and then next time you go to use it somewhere else in the yard or back in the garden, it'll dump those weed, those seeds right back into the ground. Um, so just taking a paper towel or, or even, you know, just wiping it off, but wherever you wipe it, make sure that the, the dirt and things that come off go into a trash bin or somewhere where you're okay for potential seed, weed seed to go. Um, and then remember how weeds can travel, right? How their seeds can travel. So these are two pictures that I have taken just in the last couple months. Um, so the one on the left are gonna be, there's some horse weed that got on a pair of rubber boots I was using as I was walking through a muscadine field. Um, and then this is uh, my foot with a bunch of bittercrust seed from this late winter when I was just walking around my yard and I come in the house and take my socks off and there must have been 50 to 100 seed just trapped in my shoe and in my sock and I thought you know if I had gone somewhere else to somebody else's house or something you know that could have been potentially spreading um, those weed seeds. All right so then we have avoidance. So avoidance is simply defined as weeds already exist in the area but the major impacts that could come from those weeds is avoided. So you're, you're minimizing the impact uh, that those weeds could potentially um, could have. And so the tools for that are gonna be basically to help those plants outcompete the weeds, right? And so you wanna have the plant the appropriate species. We always say right plant, right place. Um, and that's the same for a garden, right? Your vegetable garden. I, it's funny, my dad and I, we often, um, and my mom both, well, we're just a gardening family. We love to grow and, and plant and grow things. And so my dad and I oftentimes have these conversations about um, different, different plants that we might be trying. Well, he lives in Florida right now. 
Um, and even though it's the panhandle of Florida, he has tried to grow, or no, I take that back. It was my uncle who lives not too far from my dad in Florida, has tried to grow Brussels sprouts in Florida. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Brussels sprouts and how they grow, but they're typically a cooler season plant. And Florida just doesn't quite get cold enough. So the idea or the fact that my dad told me, oh, they didn't quite make it, wasn't a surprise to me because he had the wrong plant in the wrong place, right? And so instead, you know, let's focus on things, you know, collard greens do work well down there. So let's, let's do something along those lines. Um, so putting the plant, the right plant in the right place, but also to get back around to what's, how do you use fertilizer as a weed management strategy? Well, having a good fertilizer program can be very beneficial. And so if you can get those plants and get them a good head start over the weeds, again, fertilizing just around where those roots are, where that plant, that crop is. So here, in the up the top picture, um, you've got our garden back in the spring where we had put in some squash and zucchini and they're little bitty guys, right? I mean, they're not much bigger than the plant and hole that we dug, but I was adamant to make sure that we fertilize the things, not too much, right? Because there is a fine line, but definitely to fertilize them to make sure, you know, that we got them up and going. So that, as you see in the bottom picture, when they got real big and that canopy got big enough, we were able to, to shade out the, the weeds that would have potentially come up and been competing for those plants. But also making sure that you're planting at the correct time, right? So a lot of times, you know, people will miss that window. I, I had somebody tell, tell me the other day, um, you know, that they wanted, I, I think it was like lettuce or something like that. And our, here in North Carolina, you lettuce is a, a spring and fall crop and they were here trying to plant it around the first part of June. And so it wasn't but two or three weeks in the ground and it started bolting. So it's like, well, one, that plant didn't get very big before it bolted and two, it bolted so it wasn't really any good. So understanding appropriate planting times can be very helpful. And then the last thing on avoidance is crop rotation. So really interesting thing about weeds and kind of the ecology of weeds, which is the whole lecture at NC State that they give um, is that weeds tend to adapt to certain crops. And so they, they study this more so on large scale row crops, like the difference between cotton and soybeans and corn. But I think it can just be just as true in your vegetable gardens in that you've got something. So let's look here at the bottom picture. We've got tomatoes growing in the, the background. You've got squash and cucumber or squash and zucchini in the middle. And then we they look kind of shoddy, but some some beans growing here in the very foreground in the bottom left hand corner. And so those plants grow differently, right? So the tomatoes are going to get really, really tall and can shade out a lot, not just underneath the canopy, but on either side of that canopy. You've got squash and zucchini, which are relatively also moderately tall plant, you know, maybe knee high by the time they get mature. And so, and they also cover a lot of ground um, around them. So they can also shade out plants. But then you've got something like beans, which especially for my case here, they didn't produce a very good stand. And so weeds were a lot more susceptible there, but you've got some weeds that do better in, uh, in areas where, you know, the, the crops grow a lot slower. You've got some weeds that can totally outcompete them, even a tall plant. And so when you rotate those crops, you can almost break up the cycle of those weeds and, and there's a lot of other benefits, of course, that we won't go into with crop rotation, but the key is you're trying to break up that cycle of that weed coming up year after year, especially on those annual, annual weeds. So A for avoidance. And then we've got M is for monitor. So monitor is basically the definition that I give is correct identification of the pest through scouting and record keeping of the management practices that you are using. And so key on this first and foremost is scout for those weeds often right so you're not going to know that there's even weeds there if you're not even looking for them and so you know many of you might be like myself where i go looking for weeds because i actually enjoy pulling weeds that's something i have um it, i think it's a trait that i've gained from my father because i will just go and sit out in the yard and just pull weeds and it it's therapeutic for me so I, there i am just naturally seeking out those weeds to pull but in your garden, you know, a lot of times we get distracted by, oh, look at this plant, you know, look this tomato coming on, or oh, look at, look how big and beautiful these beans are. And we tend to miss the weeds whenever things really start picking up. So make sure you're scouting and you're looking for those weeds. Um, because again, if you can see them and you can pull them when they're small, it's going to be a lot easier than waiting until they're big. 
Um, but also keep a record of what crop was planted where and what weed species you might have had as an issue. So one of the, the issues that we have in our garden is going to be nut sedge, which I'm sure none of you are familiar with, right? Um, and so nut sedge is a problem in our garden. Thankfully, it's not a huge problem, but it very well can be if we let it get out of hand. But it's in an isolated spot, and so we can recognize that as we move and replant things in different areas, we can remember, hey, there's nut sedge right here. So the, the top picture that you see is actually my garden journal, if you will, something that I've always wanted to do, but it wasn't until now that I've really devoted myself to say, okay, Kira, you know, jot down as you see at the top of, on the left-hand side of the page is, is the actual where crops are planted. So that from year to year, I, or from season to season even, I can say, okay, well, Lettuce was way over here on the left, so now I'm going to put it in the middle. Um, and then I just keep a calendar, basically, of different tasks. So things like, when did I plant something? When was it fertilized? When was it harvested? So that I can go back, because the way life goes, we get busy and don't always fully remember things, is I might say, well, gosh, I don't remember the last time I fertilized. Well, I can go back and look and say, okay, that was three days ago, or oh my gosh, it was three weeks ago. So keeping a record you know, and it doesn't have to be, I'm very detail oriented, so mine might look a little more organized, but if you just jot it down, right, we all have extra pads of paper, just kind of keep it in your, in your shed or out close to the garden where it can, can stay rainproof and just jot that stuff down so that you know what's happening or what has happened, the history of your garden. And then there's never been or rarely has there been a a presentation given through extension by an extension horticulture agent or even a former one where they do not make a recommendation on a, a soil test and so I would highly encourage you if you've not done one to have a soil test done on the areas in which you are trying to maintain the weeds or at least get something to grow mildly well right and so whether that be your lawn your landscape beds but in, in this case for your vegetable gardens and so that was one of the first things I did when we moved here and you'll see the box on the left, the, the sample ID is shortened for vegetable garden because I wanted to know what was there so that I wasn't either over for fertilizing or so I knew exactly what fertilizer to put in, but also so I would just know the pH, right? Or, or different elements that that soil test can come back and give you. And so having that, again, that soil test will give you those appropriate um, recommendations. And then the last um, part of the PAMS approach, which is kind of the more uh, tangible, if you will, like prevention and avoidance is almost unlikely that you'd be able to prevent weeds from getting into an area like that. If we go back to our definition, weeds come in because of human disturbance. So unless you're just totally not disturbing an area, it's unlikely that you will see prevention. Avoidance um, is a little, more, you can be a little more successful with that, but again, um, you're not going to totally avoid them. So what we do is we suppress the weeds, and suppression is defined as allowing some pest pressure, so allowing some weeds to kind of be present in order to reduce the economic loss when prevention and avoidance are not successful. So basically it's allowing, saying, okay, you know, it doesn't have to be spit spot, we can have some weeds um, because if we try to control all the weeds and totally, you know, do whatever we can, it'll be a lot of time, potentially a lot of money that goes into that. And it's just, it, it doesn't outweigh the benefits um, of having just a few weeds there. So we've got several tools to go with this and they're kind of under these categories. So the first category is gonna be cultural, um, cultural suppression, which will include narrow row spacing, which sometimes with our home gardens, um, can be a little challenging, or, or in our case, it's actually not that hard because we don't have a whole lot of space. So I, my husband will tell you, I cram that stuff in there as tight as we can possibly do it and still be within those recommended uh, plant spacings or seed spacings or whatever. And so with narrow row spacing, what you're doing is allowing that canopy, when the plants get bigger, that canopy to cover the soil so that you don't have, um, so that you're limiting light exposure to the soil and weeds germinating. And so narrow row spacing is a really great way to do that. Also reduce tillage, which again is one of those double-edged swords as well, I recognize because we say, you know, tillage is really helpful to, um, is for some people, uh, some of the only ways that you can actually manage those weeds. Um, when we talk about organic production, 
uh, and even sweet potato, just general sweet potato production, tillage is a key component to um, weed management. So don't hear me say that reduced tillage is the only way to do that um, because it is okay. Again, kind of a side note to go back and remind you that all of these different concepts that I'm presenting here, it's not a, oh, I have, if I do all of these, I'm going to be able to fully manage the weeds that I have. That, that is, that's not the case at all. Um, and it's, it, it's more of, here's your tools, right? What of these tools will work best for you in your situation? And it's more so about how can you combine some of these tools? So instead of relying just on reduced tillage, how can you do maybe narrow row spacing with reduced tillage and maybe some cardboard, right? To help with some of that mulch, you know, as a mulch option. Um, so combining some of these things. And again, just wanted to reiterate that um, so that as you hear these things, you're not, I know some of you are just scribbling as fast as possible. If, if Peggy Walzer was on this, she would just have a notebook full of all these inf this information I'm providing. But just know it's not a, I have to do all of these. It's a, it, apply as many of these as you possibly can um, to get the best results. So again, reduce tillage. If you, you know, when we're tilling the soil, even if, with, if it's with just a, a garden hoe, you know, we're basically breaking up that soil and bringing seeds up to the top that will then germinate. Um, so again, it's kind of a, a somewhat double-edged sword because you're able to knock the weeds down that are there, but you could be bringing some up from the soil seed bank. Um, and then you've got things like cover crops. So using uh, green, green vegetation, either between the rows or a lot of times, or it, it's oftentimes encouraged during the winter time if you don't grow a fall garden, or if you don't do a fall garden, or even a, a late winter garden to do a cover crop blend. Um, there's tons of resources out there about that, um, that you can, so this area, and that's something I've considered doing in ours, is areas that we don't use in the winter to go in and, and sow something like um, vetch or clover or you know something that also won't become a weed later um, but to put that down to help control uh, the weeds through the winter time and then you've got things like mulch so a lot of people use uh, some type of hay or you know even grass clippings depending on where you got the grass clippings from if it's from our yard it's probably not the most weed free um, but then we've determined that cardboard is the best for us. We get a lot, you can, those of you that are familiar with Amazon Prime, we get a lot of Amazon Prime boxes. Um, and we had a, a new dryer come in a while back. So that provided a huge supply of cardboard. And it's been really helpful for us. And over time, yep, the cardboard breaks down just a little bit, but we just kind of rotate it. You know, if, when we decide we're going to plant over here in this back corner, uh, we just move that cardboard to somewhere else or cut it up and, and put it around the plants. Um, and then the last thing is on cultural is irrigation management. So I've, I had this picture from another uh, slideshow that I've done before. And again, like we talked about in, um, uh, I think it was prevention, um, is that you want to water where it's necessary, right? So in this picture, it's a very almost bad example, or it's not the best example of irrigation in that they're throwing that water. Yeah, it's watering all their crops, but it's also watering all their weeds as well. So that's where it's helpful if you have a drip irrigation system is probably one of the most efficient ways. Um, but also like in our case, we just water, we have a, a rain barrel system. And so we just use, pull the water from that and water directly to the crop. So, you know, when you, that, that, in order to do that, when you plant the crop, you're going to have to either form a bowl or as here, like some type of um, uh, a planting row that you can direct that water specifically. But there's a lot of other issues with overhead irrigation um, that you've probably heard about before, including issues with disease. Um, and so again, that's a different topic. But just keep in mind that the drip irrigation or irrigation to the base of the plant is often much better and much more efficient than overhead irrigation. A couple other suppression tools are going to be physical. So uh, mowing in the uh, mowing frequently. So that's going to apply more to your lawn. Uh, but for some people, you know, let's jump back. If this is how you handle your vegetable garden and you have row middles that are wide enough and you've got grass growing in between, making sure those are mowed down. Um, and then weed eating, you know, any tall weeds that may come up or weed eat around the edges, your borders, um, to keep those weeds down. And then hand removal, right? That's oftentimes one of the simplest ways 
to get rid of weeds. But again, it's all about the timing. If you can target those weeds when they're little, when they're seedlings, when they're less than four inches tall, they're usually much easier to pull up. And they oftentimes do not have the reproductive um, parts to them. So they probably haven't flowered and therefore they probably have not gone to seed. So you have no liability of pulling that weed and dispersing the seed as you do it. But you want to think about, again, what is that weed and what is the biology of that weed? So this picture on the top right is a picture of nut sedge that's come, that was coming up in our garden. Well, I just got frustrated with it and just pulled it. Well, guess what? Guess what I left in the ground with, you know, to come up later was the root and the tuber that was <laughs> still attached to the base of that plant. And so I may have pulled the leaves up, but three or four days later, it looked just like this because I did not consider or did not take the time to go get the trowel to dig up the soil in order to really get the part of the root or get the part of the weed that that is um, will continue to grow. And so again, consider tubers, rhizomes, what structures are there under the soil that you might be missing. And then from a biological standpoint, this was kind of a, you know, I, there's not a whole lot really biologically we can um, do from a weed control or weed management standpoint, but it was kind of like, well, I guess if you have goats, you know, they, they say that goats eat anything, but I've seen some picky goats before. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will think, oh, this is great. I'll put my chickens in the garden and they'll run through, they'll eat the bugs, they'll eat the weeds, you know, but I will caution you just to say, even with our case, how we had the rabbits coming through, I mean, it would have been lovely if they ate the weeds and not my collard greens, but one of the things you do want to be mindful of if you allow animals, um, you know, livestock in your garden area is the food safety concern. Um, and again, that in, is also a whole different topic that, you know, we could spend 10, 15 minutes discussing. But just be aware that for everything that goes into the mouth of that chicken, it's got to come out. And those chickens, I guarantee, are not thinking, oh, you know, I've got to go. Let me get out of this vegetable garden area. And they're probably just doing it right there as they're continuing to eat your weeds. And, you know, so there's just some, some heart, the potential to have, uh, you know, some, some foodborne illnesses that could be associated with that. Uh, not saying that to, to scare anybody or, or make anybody real concerned um, or overly concerned, but it's just something to keep in mind that you might want to look into if this is a practice that you um, utilize. But like I said, it would be lovely if the chickens and goats could target the weeds and then do everything else outside of the garden. But last but not least, or um, in my mind, it's not least, we do tend to talk about it last because we want you to consider the other suppression tools. We want you to consider how can you culturally control, how can you physically control um, those weeds before you just automatically bust out, you know, okay, time for the herbicides. You know, you, you don't consider anything else. Your first go-to is gonna be chemical. I, I strongly do not, or I would not recommend that really. Um, I would say, how can you manage those weeds in other ways and then let the chemical control um, come kind of towards the end. But let's just talk about that kind of in general. So when we do discuss chemical, we need to recognize, and, and again, most of you are probably familiar with all these differences, um, but just things to, I wanna reiterate and keep in mind is, you know, is it a selective or non-selective, right? So um, this is what we use around our yard because this is what is, is helpful for us. We, we, there's only so much weed pulling that I can do and there's only so much that I can really manage. So, you know, every couple months, this is the product that we use. Um, I didn't, I'm not putting this on there to solicit it by any means. It's just an example of, you know, so, but this is a, a, a non-selective product, right? So it's going to target everything. Um, but then considering is it pre versus post emergent, a lot of times your pre emergence can be very helpful in a garden setting, you know, because you can put it down, it'll control or at least help prevent the weeds from emerging. And oftentimes, at least in a transplant, if you're transplanting the crop setting, it does very little if if no damage to those transplants. And so just kind of, you know, is that something that could be an option? Also consider weed size. So a lot of times if you flip this bottle over on the back, it's gonna be a little booklet called the label. And that is gonna give you information on the, the best time to, um, how the best way to control, it, control those weeds. So we consider weed size. And this again, isn't just for chemical. It also has to do with 
um, cultural, right? Like pulling those weeds or, or uh, uh, mechanical when you're hand weeding, you know, the smaller the weed, the more effective that product will be on the on killing the weed. Um, and then timing, uh, again, that has to do somewhat with weed size, but it also has to do with, is the wind blowing? What time of the day is it? Is it really hot? Is it really cold? Um, you know, is it about to rain? When's the next chance for rain coming? And if it's around here, you know, they say it's 10% chance of rain, but lo and behold, at three o'clock in the afternoon, here it comes and you just put out, you know, whatever product 30 minutes ago that's only rained fast in two hours. So how effective is that gonna be? Also consider the rate. You know, some people may say, well, I'll just put out less product because I think that's probably safer. Um, not exactly. There has been a lot of research done on rate application and you want to put out the rate that's on the bottle. Whatever the product calls for, that's what's going to be effective. If you try to go under the rate, um, you could end up just not killing the weed at all and actually develops some form of a tolerance to that product. And then if you put too much, if you think, well, more is, you know, if, if the right amount's good, then more has got to be better, right? Well, that's not the case either. In doing so, you'll actually be um, wasting money because you'll be putting out more than is needed for effectiveness. And then we also talk about PPE. So uh, my, I always joke and say, this is not how you have to dress to spray your yard. Um, Typically, now if you know using something like this product here, like my husband and I use, we he does not dress up like this to spray the yard. But there are basic PPE or PPE for those who are not familiar is personal protective equipment. It's it's what you should be wearing when you make an application uh, with a pesticide. And typically, the bottle will tell you, the label will tell you what exactly you should be, um, what you should have on. And the even if it doesn't, the minimum is usually long sleeve shirt, long sleeve pants, close toed shoes. And, you know, if possible, or gloves, now I know right now it's really hot. So wearing, you know, long sleeve pants and shirt can be very, very hot. My husband doesn't even do it like that. Um, and so, but when you're done, you need to take those clothes off and wash off or, or something so that you can remove any residue that may have gotten on you. So just be aware, these are just things to be mindful of when we're talking about chemical control. But I do wanna talk about a couple caveats and then, then I'll be wrapping it up. So always read and follow the label because again, you're not gonna have an extension person that's not talking to you about pesticides that won't say the label is the law um, because that is in fact the case. So what that label is not just, oh, this is your you know, optimum or here's just some basic recommendations. No, that is, if you use that product inconsistent with what's on the label, you are essentially breaking the law. Um, but at the same time, that label, like I said just a minute ago, is also very helpful in understanding, you know, if it says it doesn't control weeds over six inches, it's not going to control weeds over six inches. So for you to spray it on something that's 10 feet, you know, or 10 inches tall with flowers all over it, probably not going to really work. So you can't be frustrated when it doesn't. Um, you also want to consider the cost of benefit, you know, question, asking yourself, is the money spent on these products necessary? So the example I have with that is this is the outside edge of our garden. Um, so you can see now it's starting to grow back, but you can see here there is a potential or trying to be a weed free zone. So my husband sprays that because one, we don't have a weed eater and it's cheaper for us to spray this one time, you know, every three or four months and keep the weeds from being closer and getting into our garden than it is for me to spend, you know, two, three, four hours trying to keep all this hand weeded because again, there's a lot of grass, there's a lot of sedges that can be difficult to hand weed and control. So for us, that cost benefit, it, it's more of a benefit for us to just do a quick spray than it is for us to spend money to either buy a weed eater or um, to spend time on our hands and knees pulling that up. Um, and then you also want to consider the effect on the environment and as well as human health. So that my point to that is going to be um, simply that if you do make a chemical application, be sure that you're reading what is the, the what they call the re-entry interval or the REI. And so how soon after you make that application can someone or something go back on top of that? So this more applies to like your lawn, if you're making an application, you know, for that, for your pets or any children that might enjoy using that lawn or that area, 
How long do they need to wait before they can go back on that? And then in terms of effect on the environment, some of these products do have uh, aquatic restrictions. And so just making sure you're not spraying it around any streams or creeks that may be near your house. But again, all of that's gonna be listed on the label. Um, one other thing is that you wanna calibrate the sprayer if you're making large broad spectrum applications. So for those of you that have like a half acre garden and you wanna put out a pre-emergent, Absolutely. I mean, that will probably be very beneficial um, in the long run during your growing season uh, in that it will help keep those weeds down. But if you're doing something on that big of an area, you want to calibrate. And that, that's something that you can ask your extension agent about and they can kind of help you walk through those, um, through those steps on how you actually do that calibration. Uh, and then lastly, create buffers between desired plants and weeds to be sprayed. That sounds kind of intuitive, but I will tell you, it, it is not. Um, because we have, we've actually, so in our garden, uh, to the left and right, both of us around our house are sweet potato fields. And the guys in, in whatever other row crops get planted from year to year, and those guys will spray things. And the buffer from our garden, the grass is about 10 foot, and then you have the, their plant, their row crop area. And that is not often far enough. And we have gotten a little bit of, you know, uh, drift damage from that. Nothing that I have been overly worried about because our garden is right next to their, um, their fields. But, you know, if we knew that they were coming, we could potentially put up some kind of buffer. Well, as an example, um, when my husband sprays and he sprays around the garden, I always carry around a piece of cardboard. So when he's out there spraying the outside edge, I've got that cardboard inside between the plant and the weeds he's spraying. We also developed this little ingenious thing that I, it is not my, uh, I did not actually create this idea. I saw it somewhere else and we have just implemented it, but basically using a milk jug as a hooded sprayer and a close-up picture of that would be this and so and he used it this weekend and he was like wow Kira this thing has great precision like I can put it right over where I want it and that's where the spray goes and so that might be something that you consider putting on you know I'm sure many of you go through milk or orange juice or some type of container where you can take the top and stick your nozzle through it and boom you've got instantly a hooded sprayer and you can use it so you'll see in this picture he's kind of going around some of our pepper plants um, now this is just as an example uh, but he definitely could have used it and i would have felt comfortable that he wouldn't have gotten things on or wouldn't have gotten the spray actually on the the crop um, so with that i know that was a lot um, and appreciate everybody listening in uh, and i hope that i'm under time i didn't have a clock right in front of me but um so with that i'll take any questions that anybody might have um and hopefully i can do my best to answer them charlotte do you want me to stop share or how do you want to handle that um you can leave it up for just a minute so that was excellent Kira. we do have a couple of questions in the chat that i think we'll go ahead and cover and then okay. um if you'll be able to ha hang out with us until we wrap up at 11 30 we can we can go back and get more questions in will that be okay yeah that'll be fun all right fantastic so earlier on there was a question in the chat about um weed free mulch is there any way to get it <laughs> or to know uh, you're getting weed free mulch do you have any tips on that uh yeah so that's a great question um it can be very difficult to know that uh, one of the things that i would recommend is one if you're buying mulch in bulk so you know if you're going to a, a local supplier and they've got them in those huge concrete bins um, pay attention and see when you're there are there weeds growing in the piles right because if there are then that's an indication that there's additional weed seeds in that pile and that you could be taking those home with you but also ask the question right like ask the people there who own it or who are working it and say hey can you verify that there are no weeds in this mulch um you know and some of them may say well i don't know or i'm not the one in charge or whatever but you know by inquiring it, it might actually stem from them to say, oh, well, you know, people are actually, you know, concerned that there might be weeds in this mulch. Um, but in terms of buying, you know, bulk from a, or buying bag from a garden center, uh, it can be a little tricky. Um, you know, one of the things that 
I think about is, you know, those, those, they're in those plastic bags, right? And a lot of times when, especially in the summer, when we get those bags, they're very, there's a lot of condensation on the inside just from, uh, as that mulch is kind of breaking down, it's respiring and you've got, you know, so it gets really hot inside those bags. So part of me wants to think like, oh, you know, it probably, it may get hot enough that it's actually killing those weed seed, almost like a form of solarization. What's going but, on? Um, we, we can't going really on? rely that, on that. Boy, Davey Avenue's a mess. Yeah, I came out broad. I was going to walk, I couldn't even get there. I think we've got somebody unmuted, <laughs> but I can't find them. <laughs> so while that might not be the exact answer the, the person was looking for, so yeah, it is very hard, but my recommendation is always to ask, especially from those um, mulch suppliers, like, hey, can you, you know, can you confirm, or, or what degree can you say that there's, there's weeds in this mulch, so. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, I was just trying to look back through the chat. It seems like we have some questions about specific weeds. Maybe we'll, we'll save those for the end. Um, mm -hmm. And lots of people just saying thank you and what a great job you did. So I'll just second that. So excellent. Thank you so much for being with us. And like I said, we'll come back to some of these questions at the end so you can continue to add them in the chat. Um, but if you'll stop sharing, Kira, I'll go ahead and start sharing. Um, and we're going to finish up with our plant and weed of the month and also our bolos for the month. Is that, has, I, I don't know if that's stop share. I see a screen, but it's not. It has. Okay. Yep, it has. Thank you. Yeah, it's just nope. taking me. Now I have to find all of my <laughs> controls, too, <laughs> on my screen. Let's see. All right, excellent. So to, to stick with the weed theme, we're going to jump into our weed of the month. And I have a poll question. I want to see how many people are seeing this weed in their yard. Um, and so you're, let me go ahead and launch the poll. So you have your options. Uh, see the picture here. If, if you're seeing it everywhere, A, in a few spots, B. If you're not sure, C. And if you're not seeing it, D. Give folks just a couple more minutes. Lots of votes coming in. This is definitely one of the, this is our weed of the month, and this is one of those things where it just seems to all of a sudden pop up. So I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So um, what we're seeing is a lot, 30% of people are saying yes everywhere. 45% um, are saying yes in a few spots. So you're actually in a good position if you're just seeing it in a few spots to get a handle on this. Um, so um, we, you know, we, we want you to, to go ahead and, and pay attention to this, the weed and um, make sure you get control of it. A few people are not sure and a few very lucky people are saying no, they don't have it yet. So you want to be keeping an eye on that. So this weed is chamber bitter. It has actually has several common names. Gripe weed, I think, is one that Gardner certainly came up with. Um, Phylanthus urinaria. Um, and Phylanthus uh, is the genus, but urinaria is the species name. And you might think, well, that's an odd species name, but it is, comes from the fact that this plant is sometimes used or believed to have medicinal um, properties to treat kidney stones. So if you're really desperate, you can go out there and graze on it. <laughs> um, but that is not an extension uh, research-based recommendation, but it is one way it is used medicinally in other parts of the world. Um, it is a warm season annual, so it comes up, especially once soil temperatures hit 70 degrees. Um, and that once it hits 70 degrees, like we, we have reached, it just starts popping up everywhere. That's why it seems like it's not there, and then all of a sudden it's everywhere. The, the temperatures get to the right range. It is in the spurge family, um, and there are other spurge weeds um, that, that are really low growing, that when you break the stems, they have a white sap. This one does not produce that white sap, so um, it, it doesn't have that property, but it is in that spurge family, and like many plants in the spurge family, it produces lots and lots of seeds um, on the back side of the leaf. Um, another common name for the plant is little mimosa, and that comes from these compound weeds, um, uh, compound leaves, 
where you can see it has all these little leaflets along a stem, which does look similar to a mimosa tree. Um, and they come up and um, grow to about one to two feet. If they're growing among other plants, they can get a little larger. Um, but you want to get them as soon as they pop up because they can go from just being a seedling to producing seed within a few weeks. Um, so stay on top of them, get them just as soon as they come up. And that is one of your best control options is to prevent them from producing more seed. So you can see here the little teeny tiny flowers on the back of the leaf, on the back of the stem where the, the leaflets join the stem. And um, then everywhere there was one of those little flowers, you get a seed forming. And um, this again takes place within just a few weeks. So you really have to stay on top of pulling them. And right now is the time to really go out there and look for them. The, even the young ones, when they come up, look very similar to this. They have the, the divided leaflet, the um, pinnate leaf. So if you're going to be managing this weed from a year-round standpoint, you kind of think it's a summer annual, it comes up. So think about your actions before it comes up and then after it comes up. So before it germinates, so winter and spring, you'll want to mulch because this is one of those weeds that the seeds need to be exposed to light to germinate. So you want to keep a very uh, good consistent layer of mulch two to three inches deep so that those seeds are buried and not being exposed to light. Then remember, anytime you dig in the soil, you're going to bring some of those seeds up. So look out after you plant something and keep an eye out for little seedlings coming up and get them before they have the opportunity to um, set seed. And that's what you do after it germinates. It's just that frequent hand weeding to prevent more seed production. You can use non-selective herbicides when it's really young. Um, you just have to be really careful not to get those herbicides on your desirable plants. Um, and Kira mentioned um, prevention as one of the ways to manage weeds. And this is very true for chamber bitter. Um, it's often brought in with nursery plants, so that's tends, tends to that's how we think it was introduced to landscapes. Um, so inspect your plants when you buy them and look for any little weed seedlings that are coming up. And keep an eye on newly planted plants. So the first year after you plant something, um, keep a closer eye on it and make sure there's nothing unusual coming up, any new weeds sprouting up. Anything you see come up, be sure to pull it when it's really small. And then our plant of the month, we're going to be focused on pollinators this, this month. Um, if you've never seen any of the beautiful posters available from the Pollinator Partnership, I really encourage you to check them out. Um, this is a little snippet from this year's pollinator poster, and they are available online. You can download them um, as, a, as an image, but you can also order the beautiful print copies. So we're going to talk about one of the absolute best plants for pollinators, and those are the mountain mints or a pycnanthemum species. There are at least 13 species native to North Carolina, and even though it's called mountain mint, they occur from the mountains to the coast, so it's not just a mountain plant. Um, they're, not, they're not mint like spearmint or peppermint, which are mintsa, but they are in the mint family, which is Lamiaceae. And like many plants in that family, they have those square stems. They have fragrant, minty-scented foliage when you crush it up. And some of the species particularly can spread vigorously. So this is a plant you may be more interested in using in a natural area or somewhere it's okay to let it spread. Um, but you definitely want to have at least one species of pigmanthum in your yard because among all trials of plants that attract pollinators, this always ranks the highest um, for both the, the number, just the number of things that are visiting it, as well as the diversity of pollinators that are attracted. So you'll see all kinds of bees, other pollinators, beneficial insects, moths and butterflies. Um, so this is a great plant um, to have for pollinators. It's a summer bloomer. It does prefer, prefer sun and generally moist soil, but it is super, super tough. So it can tolerate part shade and um, some species particularly will tolerate drought rather well. So I just want to mention three species really quickly. Um, first is the slender mountain mint, which is Pycnanthemum tenufolium, you see on the left. Um, and it has these little tiny white flowers and this very narrow foliage, which in itself is quite attractive. Um, and in the winter, it looks really interesting. I like the, the they get the steely gray color, the old flower heads, the seed heads. 
um, and the foliage kind of persists. So it looks nice in the winter. Um, it is probably, in my opinion, the most well-behaved in the garden because it just forms this mat that spreads and gets bigger, but it, it stays together. It doesn't send shoots off, you know, several inches or feet away. Um, so it's going to be one for smaller beds, especially. Um, it, it's a great one for any garden, but especially if you need a uh, picnanthemum to um, stay in place a little better and um, not get too large. It's only about two to three feet tall, so it makes it means it's one of the shorter mountain mints. The one in the middle, blunt mountain mint, or sometimes called short tooth mountain mint, Picnanthemum muticum, um, is a little taller and a little more vigorous, so three to four feet, and especially in moist soils, it can be quite vigorous um, and quite happy, so it's a good plant for a meadow or um, kind of at the edge of the woods or the edge of a pond or something like that. If you do put it in a drier site, it's a little easier to uh, manage. It's not quite as vigorous in drier soils. Um, at the edge of the woods, as long as it gets a little bit of sun, it still blooms quite nicely. And you can see it's more typical with our mountain mints. They tend to have very, very tiny flowers, um, but the flowers are surrounded by these silvery colored bracts, um, which makes them, makes them look a little showy or more ornamental than just the tiny flowers alone. Um, and they persist for a long time, those kind of um, silvery colored bracts. Then last of all, I want to mention the Loomis' Mountain Mint, which is on the right, and Picnanthemum lumisii. Um, it's a little taller again, four to five feet tall, and it's very similar to some of our other mountain mints, which are extremely vigorous spreaders, things like Hoary Mountain Mint and Southern Mountain Mint, um, which are gorgeous plants. They are among the prettiest mountain mints because they have these really showy white bracts, um, but they are very, very vigorous spreaders. Um, the, what is different about this Picnanthemum, uh, the Loomis Mountain Mint, is it is more of a clumper. But unfortunately, it is not very widely available. So not many nurseries grow it, um, so you have to really search for it. Um, but especially if you want one of these larger type mountain mints with the very showy bracts, um, this would be worth searching for if you need one that's going to stay in place. If you've got somewhere you can let these others spread, like the Picnanthemum in Canum or Picnanthemum Picnanthemoides, um, strongly recommend having those because they are beautiful plants and you will be amazed at the number of pollinators that are on these plants in the summer. All right, with that I'm going to turn it over to Matt for our bolos. I'm going to stop my share so he can start sharing. Uh, thanks Charlotte. All right, I've just got a few things to share today. Uh, in addition to bolos, I've got a couple of announcements and things to be, well, they're technically bolos, but uh, things to be on the lookout for. Okay, let's see. Can everybody see that? Yes. Charlotte, yeah. can you see that? Great. Okay, so the first thing is you've probably seen on social media that there have been unsolicited seeds being sent from China to random residents of the U.S. Uh, multiple states are including that are are reporting this, including North Carolina. We had a message about somebody receiving them. Uh, these are in packages marked as typically as jewelry or something else. Uh, the seed types are unknown at this point, but they could pose a serious risk to U.S. ecosystems and agriculture. So, if you receive these seeds, please do not plant and or dispose of them. We we'd like to get samples to NCDA if you get them. Um, so they can track them and find out what they are. Uh, but again, don't plant or dispose of them. The, even the plants, even if the plants aren't invasive, they could have diseases on them that once getting out into the wild could have really bad effects. Now, uh, a lot of people are gonna ask, well, what, why are they sending these? Uh, one of the best um, theories I've seen is that this is actually part of a business scam, not some kind of bioterrorism or anything like that. Uh, they send these to get uh, inflated numbers on the no on the amounts of uh, things shipped or received by people. But uh, regardless of what it is, definitely let NCDA know if you have um, uh, received any of these. And actually, Charlotte, if you wouldn't mind putting that link I put at the bottom, that's the one that uh, Lucy Bradley posted. I think that's a good explanation. It has good links for the NCDA information. Uh, so if you could post that in the chat, that'd be great. Sure. Okay, so other than unsolicited seeds, we also have to worry about Asian longhorn beetles. So uh, I don't know how many of you have heard, but they have been found now in South Carolina. 
they have established in a several square mile area around Charleston. Uh, now, we were pretty happy that they didn't uh, come down here before. They've been in the U.S. since about 1996 in the Northeast, around the lakes in the Northeast areas. Uh, and they hadn't moved down here or been found down here, but now that they're found in South Carolina, people should really be on the lookout for this, this beetle. It's very destructive. It's a large showy species, very shiny black with some white dots, striped antennae and bluish feet. Uh, it's a little over an inch long, um, and they will actually attack healthy trees. That's why these are such an issue. Um, the lar they basically chew in the bark, lay an egg, uh, the larva bores in, and the exit holes are so big, and the larger larvae, when they bore into the plants, are so big, you can actually stick a pencil inside the hole. That's how large they are. And because of all this damage to the trees, they can cause them to be weakened and can introduce uh, pathogens in there that will kill the trees eventually. Uh, they typically attack maples, uh, but will feed on other trees. There's some lists on some of the websites, and I can send that later. Uh, when Mike is talking, I'll send a link to the uh, Clemson site that has some good information on them. Uh, but they do not attack conifers. And quickly, this is what they look like. The larvae are very large, as you can see, uh, as are the adults. Uh, this little uh, divot in the bark is where the adult female has chewed a small cavity to lay the egg inside. And that allows the larva entrance into the plant. And you can see these very large, you can see this finger here, very large boreholes when they exit out. So be on the lookout for these beetles. We really want to catch infestations early. Um, but also note that there are some lookalikes that are native. So the cottonwood borer is probably the most similar looking, uh, but their antennae are solid colored and they have much more white uh, on their body than the Asian longhorn beetle does. They're very closely related though. Another close relative are the common pine sawyers. Often they're brown or gray with mottled pattern, uh, but some species are darker like this scutellatus. Um, and you can see how it might be confused. Again, it doesn't have striped antennae. Uh, also, the body surface is much more rough on monocamus species. You can see this rough kind of granular look, say, compared to the smooth, shiny look of the Asian longhorn beetle. All right, just to be on the lookout for that, uh, just in case. Uh, we hope it is managed in Charleston or doesn't leave that area, but you never know. And please be on the lookout. All right, just one thing I wanted to mention that I saw for the first time myself, but um, you may see out there, uh, beach blight aphids. Uh, these are found on beech trees. Uh, they're these very fuzzy aphids that form huge masses along the branches. Uh, they do not harm the tree, so even if you see them, don't worry about them. They're not gonna uh, cause any issues. They're native, they're, they've been found on this host for a long time, for as long as the trees have been around. Um, and, uh, Sometimes you'll see a big patch of sooty mold or black soot on the ground. And if you look up, the branches will maybe have these uh, aphids. And I just wanted to also show, because there's a really cool behavior they have. They're really alien looking. And I took this video. And so if you could see, so here's them moving. And then if you disturb them, they move all crazy. Like they dance around and they're trying to fend off predators or whatnot. Again, they're not dangerous. They're not dangerous to trees and they're just something fun to behold. Okay, now, now onto the official bolos. So um, again, cicada killers, I've been getting a lot of uh, images of cicada killers, people thinking that they're Asian giant hornets. Again, they're very active right now, uh, hunting their cicada hosts. So the cicadas you can hear out right now, the annual cicadas, these are the hosts uh, for these wasps that capture them and bury them in the ground. Again, they are, basically harmless, they're not aggressive. Uh, as long as you leave them alone, even if they're nesting nearby, uh, they shouldn't bother you. There could be a lot of large caterpillars now developing. Uh, some of the summer ones like the Daytana, the prominence of these very large hairy striped caterpillars, as well as the oak worms, these very large kind of caterpillars that have these antennae-like protuberances and thorn-like protuberances. Also close relatives of the oakworm, uh, these very large uh, hickory horn devils and some of the larger Saturnid moth caterpillars are gonna be out and about and much more noticeable because they're very large. In fact, hickory horn devils are about four inches long when they're fully grown. So 
massive caterpillars. And speaking of caterpillars, gardens are gonna be having a lot of caterpillars too. As the plants grow and mature are much bigger now, uh, things on parsley and dill and the APAC uh, family, you're gonna have uh, black swallowtail or parsley worm caterpillars, squash vine borers, uh, cabbage uh, worms and cabbage caterpillars, also hornworms, I think most people are familiar with hornworms, the young of sphinx moths. You also probably start noticing more of the large mantises and garden spiders. That's because at this time of the year, they've finally matured. They're gonna be coming, be, becoming adults with a much larger and more noticeable. The social wasp nests, including the paper wasps and the hornets nests are gonna be much bigger and more active. And there's gonna be a lot more hunting wasps out and about. Here's a spider wasp carrying a spider uh, for her young. Uh, which you will bury or put in some kind of nest. And again, just lots and lots of arthropod activity. Uh, you may see things like this mantispid, which is a really uncommon thing, but it's really cool to see. It's not a mantid or a fly, and they're sometimes called mantid flies, but it's actually related to green lace wings, but it's a predator, and also the young feed on spider eggs. Uh, or on your hibiscus, you might see these hibiscus bugs, uh, which are a scent scentless plant bug. And since they feed on the fruits of the hibiscus, they're really not a pest. They're kind of just something to behold uh, and are not necessary to treat. So those are some of the bolos. Um, I'll let Mike go and uh, I'll read some of the chat comments if they've come up and, uh, and try and answer them at the end. All right, thanks, Matt. Let me go ahead and share my screen here in one moment. So, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, oh, Mike, you. Yes, we can, Mike. Very good. Um, Hello again, and I chose to do kind of a special highlight on three of the bolos for this month because they, they one, two, because they came up recently. One <clears throat> was a set of photos that a friend of mine sent of a heart suburstan euonymus that he found these spots on, which turned out to be powdery mildew. And just a reminder that if you see the white powdery growth on um, a powdery mildew, it can occur on the upper surface, the lower surface of the leaf, or both, as in this case, versus downy mildew, which not only looks a little bit different, but also will only be occurring on the underside of the leaf. And our powdery mildews, it turns out, have a wide uh, range of hosts. Different powdery mildews, though, they tend to be fairly specific to their, their different host families, at least but uh, you may see them on these. In the vegetable garden, of course, the squashes, pumpkins, and gourds will be the most often and most heavily infested of our plants in the, in the vegetable garden for powdery mildew. And flowering dogwood, we've been seeing that since the spring, early summer, and you, can, you will continue to see that until, until frost. Euonymus, as shown in the previous picture, but uh, the Euonymus, I think it's Fortunii, tends to get very heavy colonies of of powdery mildew to the, to the extent that uh, I would think twice about using that as a landscape plant. Yeah, among the herbaceous plants, your Monarda, Coreopsis, Zinnia, and Vernonia, or ironweed, are plants that you're gonna see powdery mildew on likely or get calls about. We had the opportunity to go hiking a little bit in the Clemens State Educational Forest on Sunday and came across this tulip poplar that had a tremendous amount of slime flux coming out of it. The interesting thing was that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't odorous. It didn't have that fermented smell you usually see and it wasn't attracting insects that we could tell. But it's something that will be coming up on our hardwood trees. It's really common on white oak where it tends to flux down lower close to the, almost to the soil line. It can have a frothy look to it and attract butterflies and wasps and other insects. There is no harm done to the tree. There's, it's just the result of an internal colonization of the wood by bacteria, causes a condition called wet wood. And uh, you may have a tree that fluxes one year and not the other, but there's no real remedy that needs to be applied here. 
for our other tree and shrub, be on the lookouts for August. Improper planting, of course, and at the top of that list is planting this time of year where you've got all this stress from the, the high temperatures and in some places uh, spotty rain. But other things also like planting too deeply and girdling roots that may have come from, from the nursery situation. Always be aware that plants that are declining, trees and shrubs that are declining, may be because of a root rot. The two most common here in our area are Phytophthora and our malaria root rots. Bacterial leaf scorch will be coming into its own now. I've seen some symptoms on uh, my drive in. The bellwether redbud tree though on campus here hasn't showed symptoms yet, so that's kind of interesting. But this is something you'll most likely see on your, your red oak groups such as pin oaks also sycamores and possibly on red buds. Another leaf spot on oaks that uh, will be getting more and more common as the leaves start to decline and senesce will be the fungus tubacchia, which you can see in the photograph here on the right. And our very common, I'd say ubiquitous leaf spots on hydrangea, cercospora and coronespora. Cercospora being the, uh, the smaller spots and coronespora tending to be larger blotches. Um, those will be getting more and more common, fortunately, are just a cosmetic issue. And finally, let me mention our shot hole on flowering cherry and cherry laurel, where the spots drop out of the leaf and can give the deceptive appearance of being some kind of insect feeding. In the fruit and nut orchards, for your apples now bearing, you may be seeing a couple of different diseases on the fruit, such as black rot or bitter rot, as well as the just superficial fungi, the sooty blotch and the fly speck. On grape, the very serious Pierce's disease, which is caused by that xylella fastidiosa, so very close to the one that causes the bacterial leaf scorch on the, the uh, trees, the shade trees. And uh, on, the, on the fruit, in the case of uh, uh, vinifera grapes or on the leaves in the case of muscadines, you may have the fungus black rot. Pecan scab will be something to watch out for as we get a little bit further into the year. And on our fruits of peaches, both brown rot pictured in the lower left and scab pictured kind of in the lower center there will be, will be common. In the vegetable garden, continue to be looking for downy mildew as well as powdery mildew. Tomato, a lot of things can be happening, just to mention a few. The leaf spots, well, you could have bacterial leaf spot. Septoria, very common fungus in the, in the, especially starting out in the lower part of the tomato plant and working its way up. And then maybe as we get a little bit later, I tend to think of it as a, a later season leaf spot, the gray leaf spot, that's the photograph there in the, in the lower right. But that's gonna look a lot like septoria leaf spot when you're just uh, gazing at the plant. Uh, wilting tomatoes, multiple possible causes there, bacterial wilt, southern blight causing stem rot at the base of the, the plant, that's the soil line there. And if you dig it up and you see the classic knots on the roots, then you know you've got root knot nematode. And finally for tomatoes, do be on the lookout if you're in the mountains for late blight that was now reported in Buncombe County 11 days ago on tomato. Anthracnose, uh, which can get on the pods themselves, on beans, and cercospora leaf spot will be two fungi to watch out for in that particular crop. And I always like to mention downy mildew on basil, making your life difficult for those who want to make pesto. And to conclude, some turf grass issues for August and any month really, you can see fairy rings of different kinds. Brown patch on tall fescue and rye grass will still be issues in the warm weather and we could start seeing the large patch moving in on our, our warm season turf as well. Also gray leaf spot on fescue and St. Augustine grass that's in the lower left set of photographs there and rust I tend to think of it on zoysia but on multiple turf species you can see a photo of that in the lower right hand corner and also there's the the link to the turf vial site for any more information about these different diseases. Now let me, since I've been looking at my slide set here and not at the chat box, let me just take a quick look at the Zoom here and see if we've got any. Uh, yeah, 
There was a question, Mike, that came in uh, about mildew. You were talking about mildew. Should uh -huh. any should people do anything? Is it worth trying to control mildew? That is one of those questions whose answer depends on how uh, how serious it is. So there are there are basically three categories when it comes to powdery mildew. Those plants for which it's so minimal and cosmetic that you don't really need to do anything. That's probably the majority. And then there are a few plants, like I mentioned, some euonymus, where it's so uh, damaging, so, I don't want to say disfiguring, and common that you probably don't want to even try growing that plant. So it, uh, it wouldn't be worth trying to. And then there are a few kind of in the intermediate range um, where where it would be enough damage that you would want to do something about it. Uh, I would probably say that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're in a vegetable garden, there the, the uh, some of the cucurbits, the squashes, that get this pretty heavily there, there it might be worth doing something. So it really depends on um, if you're in that middle category of more than cosmetic, but not so much as to be futile. All right. All right. Oh, I see what's happening here. Apologize for my. So it looks like a, yeah, a lot of the other questions in the chat. There's some some questions uh, about mountain mint that I was talking about. About can you cut it back um, to keep it a little shorter? And yes, that'll help. Like most of our perennials, you can trim it in the spring. Um, you know, when it comes up and gets to be about two feet tall, you can trim off about six inches or even twelve inches. It'll branch out more. Um, if you really want to, you can you can give it another trim and say another month. Um, but once it starts blooming, you want to kind of let it do its thing. So you could probably keep it about a foot shorter, maybe a foot and a half um, with two trims than it would normally get. But overall, your best option is to to put it somewhere that it can reach the height it naturally wants to reach. All right, and I don't see any more in the chat that would be for me to address. Oh wait, what do you about the two green bean diseases? I get them every year, even with crop rotation. Uh, I may have to get you back, get back to you on that one. Um, I would suspect that anthracnose. Well, a question, one question would be: Do you save your seed, or are you buying new seed? Uh, because the I, I think anthracnose may be seed borne. Uh, the cercospor should not. So it would be a matter of making sure you cleaning up all the, the litter. Uh, rotation may help if you're in an area where the old um, residue from the previous beans has well decomposed and is gone and you're far enough away from, from where it was. So, um, But as far as a better answer, I will try and look something up and get back to you about that in our August 25th, which is a great segue into um, Oh wait, we have some more questions coming in. I'm sorry. Um, yep, someone said new seed. I have. Oh, you're saying you had you use new seed? But okay, I, I see there. Yeah, let me let me do a little research on that one. Uh, powdery mildew on crepe myrtles and they never bloom. I'm not sure those two things are related. We have uh, crepe myrtles in our yard. Was, we just actually moved in. And there's a long line of crepe myrtles, uh, and nine out of ten of them are not blooming. But they don't have powdery mildew that I've noticed. I, I tend to see powdery mildew, I think, on some of the older crepe myrtle cultivars. At least that's my bias. But uh, I would I would say that's not what's causing the lack of bloom. You might have to look into some kind of uh, site factors that might be doing that. Uh, Lace bugs, it looks like that's a good answer. point, Mike. About many of the newer varieties are mildew resistant and um, and it not necessarily being related to the blooming. Sometimes people have them in too much shade or they're uh, pruning them in the summer, you know, um, when the, after the you're disrupting the blooming through pruning them too late into the summer. But there's a lot of things that can cause them not to bloom. All right, thank you, Charlotte. And uh, I guess Charlotte answered uh, the about the lace bugs. Yeah, I don't typically see we don't typically see death of uh, 
azaleas from lace bugs, but they do make them look really bad. Um, and so you know, treating when you can, especially earlier in the spring when they first emerge is, is beneficial. Um, and uh, making sure to pay attention to the undersides of the leaves to see what life stages are out, uh, whether it's uh, the nymphs or the adults uh, or both. Um, but yeah, they just typically make them look bad and uh, they look like they want to die, but they usually hang in there. All right. I also wanted to mention there were several questions earlier on about specific weeds, how to control different weeds. Um, and so I encourage everybody to, to research, you know, these questions. And one great source for that to make sure you're getting recommendations from Extension is there is a search engine that just searches Extension. And um, it is impact.extension.org slash search. I, I put that in the chat list. It's a little further up, but it'll be one of the links that we send as a follow-up. All the links that have been shared in the chat will send out as a follow-up. Um, again, that goes to the NCEMG the email list, so you have to be a member of the list um, to get that follow-up. But um, we'll, we'll be sharing that information. Um, another way is to search, of course, any search engine such as Google. Um, you can search some, I, I usually do it, I'll do NCSU and then search if I'm trying to find information from NC State. Um, you can also do, a, do your search term and then put .edu or set the domain just to look for .edu so that way you're getting information from those sources. Um, on our extension portals, all of our websites, there is a little search bar that will let you search within extension um, for information that's available. Um, so there's lots of great information out there. You just want to make sure you're looking for research-based sources. All right. Then uh, I guess we have only to say that we will hopefully see everyone back on the fourth Tuesday of August for a little bit more. If you uh, if you can't get enough of Matt and and my stuff here. Um, we have a little more time to work with and can go a little bit into things like uh, biology and management and so on. So that will be the topic for next month's Plant Best and Pathogens. Meanwhile, if you want to see what has been done in the past, you missed a session and want to go back and look at the recordings or see what the schedule is for the rest of the year, those links are also there on the slide. I will relinquish my sharing. And I'm not sure if this is going to work, but let's try.